with us uh, tonight, uh, Dr. John Strain, and uh, uh, I don't know if I ought to call him emeritus or, or what he is exactly, but uh, he, he is uh, uh, highly exalted among the uh, extension agents uh, as a, a HORT specialist, um, but uh, John uh, comes to us um, by way of, I think you did some work in New York yourself, didn't you, John? Uh, Oregon, 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 actually. Okay, it Oregon, Minnesota. <laughs> okay, yeah. and uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you. And uh, you're talking tonight about uh, uh, pecans and walnuts and filberts and whatever you want to talk about. Okay, thank you. Let me see if I can get this thing set up. Okay, I need to get uh, share, share uh, sheen, share yeah screen sharing from you. It says the host disabled the participant screen sharing. I'll take care of that. Give me just a second. And I apologize. I should have already uh, done this. That's all right. Uh, Jeremy reminded me to record as he always does, but he forgot to tell me to uh, make you a host. So you should be able to do it now. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, okay, what do you see? <laughs> you're good to go. Okay, you've, you've got my, the right, you're seeing the right screen now then, right? Y yeah, that, that'll work. What you've okay. got is just fine. Let's see, let me. Okay, can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay. Okay, there are a number of uh, crops that are, nut crops that are native to Kentucky in the U.S. Uh, northern pecans are native, uh, as are uh, the shellbark hickory and the shagbark hickory, uh, black walnuts, butternuts, and in the chestnut area we have, of course, have the American chestnut and the chinka pin, and we have the uh, American hazelnut. Now most of our nut trees are propagated by grafting. Once you find uh, a, a variety or a, a cultivar that you like, uh, we propagate that by grafting in most cases. So uh, the chances of getting the ideal nut by planting a nut are pretty slim because there's too many uh, genes involved. Now when we look at nuts, a lot of people think, well man, this has got to be, be a really big uh, hickory or a black walnut. Uh, that's not exactly what we're looking for. We're not looking for just big nuts. We're looking for nuts that come out of the shell pretty easily, particularly in halves and so forth. And uh, uh, here we have a, a, a nut right here. Uh, we're looking for uh, something that has a good flavor, something that has a light colored kernel. This is what's really important in pecans, particularly in commerce, because if you've got darker colored kernels, uh, people get the idea that they're older nuts and they've gone rancid. So uh, we're looking for a light colored kernel and we want a high percentage of kernel to the shell. We want what we call, is called a good crack out, crack out on these. So uh, good nut production. And larger nuts help. And uh, insect and disease resistance is also important because we don't want to, uh, some of these nut trees are really big. They're difficult to spray. So here's a hickory nut right here. And this is true of black walnuts and so forth. You can see some seedling nuts on the top right up here. And uh, if you look at these, uh, there are islands of shell in the nut meat here, which means that nut meat's gonna be very difficult to extract. These are not ideal nuts to grow. Down here are named varieties of hickory. Here's Lindauer, and here's Simpson number one, one of the easiest ones to get uh, the nut meats out in halves and so forth. You can see these islands of shell are not really holding onto that kernel, so they shell out uh, much easier. Uh, like with most fruit trees, uh, we like high elevation sites. Uh, it's not quite as important for nut trees because a lot of them 
tend to bloom a little later, except for uh, hazelnuts. Uh, we like a deep, well-drained soil. The ones we're talking about uh, generally have some tap roots that go down pretty deep. Uh, you don't have to have a real fertile soil, something with a medium fertility, and the soil pH in, in the range of about 6.5 to 6.8 is very good for most nuts. That's the acidity of the soil. Now, Chinese chestnuts are like a little more acid soil in the 5.5 to 6.5 range. The reason that this pH is so important is it determines nutrient availability. Uh, you can see a lot of the different nutrients listed here. And uh, with the going from a low to a high pH, and at really low pHs, these nutrients are in the soil, but they're just not available to the trees. They're locked up in the soil and the tree can't extract them. If you raise the pH up to a certain point uh, in the 6.5 range, then they're mostly all available and it's much easier to grow them and have success. On the other hand, if your pH gets a little too high, some other nutrients, particularly a lot of the micronutrients are not very available. And so this is why pH is so important. So get a soil test, uh, prior to planting and try to adjust your soil uh, if you can. Uh, we have a publication uh, called Nut Tree Growing in Kentucky. It's got to be updated, but it's got a lot of the, as far as varieties are concerned, but it's got a lot of the, the basics of growing uh, nuts, the varieties, how to plant them, fertilization, pruning, harvesting, and, and some of the pests. Uh, that's online. Uh, you can just Google UK horticulture and then commercial fruit or you can pick one of these up at your county extension office. Uh, we also have a newly updated publication on nursery sources that lists a lot of our recommended varieties and nurseries that carry those varieties. There are not a lot of nurseries that carry nut trees, particularly grafted nut trees that do well in our area. So uh, there's, there's a few. Uh, Nolan River Nut Tree Nursery has been one of the top ones in the area for a long time. Uh, unfortunately, John Britton passed away this summer and so his daughter is uh, running that and she's not taking any new orders right now. So hopefully she'll continue to run that, but they have had a wide variety of grafted nut trees for a number of years. We have England's Orchard and Nursery over in uh, McKee, Kentucky. That's gonna be one of the ones closest to you. Uh, he carries pecans and hazelnuts. Uh, then we have Peaceful Heritage Nursery in Stanford, Kentucky that has uh, potted hazelnuts. Uh, if you're looking for pecans, Rockbridge tree, trees in Bethpage, Tennessee is really good. Uh, some of these nut trees are fairly expensive because it takes a long time to graft them and grow them. Uh, and uh, Rockbridge trees sells them in pots. So if you're going to buy a bunch of them, it might be worth your while to drive down there and pick them up rather than get them shipped. And then uh, for some of the varieties that you can't find, we have a Kentucky Nut Growers Association. And a lot of these guys trade around cyan wood. Uh, they teach you how to graft and that's a good way to get into nut tree production. <clears throat> if we look at the years to first harvest, now this is just a few nuts. This isn't really a commercial harvest. Uh, butternuts and heart nuts take about three to four years. Chinese chestnuts and hazelnuts, four to five years. Uh, Persian or Carpathian or English walnuts, about five to six years. Uh, pecans and black walnuts, seven to 10 years. Uh, you're not going to really get up to really commercial production in pecans till they're like 18 or 19 years old in general. And hickories and, and hickons, pecans are crosses between pecans and hickory, uh, at least 10 to 12 years. So we're looking at a little longer term proposition with nut trees. Uh, the pollination is very important in nut trees. You've got to get that out right uh, starting out. Uh, black walnuts are self fruitful, so you can plant one black walnut tree and you're good to go. Uh, some of the ones that are partially self-fruitful, in other words, if you have one tree, they'll still set nuts, but they're gonna do better if you've got another variety out there to cross-pollinate it. And we're not talking about another of the same variety, a different variety. So if you're looking at butternuts, uh, the Persian walnuts, heart nuts, and hickory. The ones that must be cross-pollinated are Chinese chestnuts. You've gotta have another variety of Chinese chestnuts to get your chestnut tree pollinated. And then pecans, hickons, and hazelnuts are real particular. They need another variety for pollination, but not just any other variety will do. You've got to get the right varieties for pollination. Uh, I talk to a lot of people, you know, they, they call up and say, we planted these pecan trees 20 years ago and they've never had pecans. And 
one of them died. We don't know which one died. And well, I tell them they don't have anything to pollinate it with. And so uh, they've got to wait several years to get that taken care of. So pecans, hickories, and hazelnuts have male and female flowers on the same tree. The male flowers are called catkins. They're on the one-year-old branches or the wood from the previous year. And then the female flowers are born on the tips of the uh, youngest shoots. And so they have varieties. Uh, looking at some of the terminology, you may hear the, a term called protogenous or uh, protandrous or protogenous. Protogenous means the pollen is shed first before the female flowers become viable or able, able to be pollinated. If it's protogenous, uh, the female flowers become uh, viable and then the male flowers drop their pollen afterwards. So you've got to get two of them that match up to get the, the trees pollinated. So here's some pecan flowers. This is a male flower or catnin. This one has uh, looks like it's dumped most of its pollen already. Uh, here is the female flower on the tips of the shoots, little tiny pecans, and these are the young pecans over here on the right that have uh, uh, been uh, pollinated. So we generally plant uh, nut trees in the spring. Uh, the earlier you can get them out, the better, uh, but you don't want to plant them when the soil is really wet. Uh, you need to have that soil dried out a little bit so it doesn't uh, turn to concrete when it dries out. It's a good idea to soak these uh, pecan trees if they are bare rooted, any nut tree, uh, root in water for 24 hours before planting. Don't stick them in a bucket of water for two weeks because they'll rot, okay? But uh, they've been in, some of them have been in cold storage over the winter and they'll soak some water up. It'll improve your survival quite a bit. You wanna dig a deep hole uh, wide enough for any lateral roots to be spread out. You don't want to dig a little tiny hole and shove that tree down there with a root sticking up. Uh, that's root wadding and they don't do that well uh, if you do that. Uh, these trees, as I mentioned before, pecans and hickories have tap roots. You can see this tree over on the right is a pecan tree and the tap root's been cut off. Uh, it's better not to cut that tap root off. You will get higher survival on that tree uh, if you don't cut the tap root or have a longer tap root. Uh, try not to let them dry out. If you've got broken roots, cut those off and uh, uh, make sure you dig a nice deep hole. Plant them at the same depth that they were growing in the nursery. Uh, here we have a, 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 I think this is a Carpathian walnut. Uh, you can see where it was grafted up here. Uh, the little shoot right here is the uh, uh, grafted part of that tree. And uh, we've dug a nice hole, spread the roots out. Instead of digging a two foot diameter hole, I just dug it, dug it out to the side here and laid the root down, put it in at the right level, fill the soil in around it, uh, throw the top soil in the bottom of the hole and uh, uh, fill it in and water it in good with a bucket of, a five gallon bucket of water to set that tree. Don't count on a rain that evening. Uh, in fertilizing, uh, we've just got some kind of rough recommendations on fertilizing nut trees. Uh, you determine the diameter of the trunk about five inches above the ground, and you put about a pound of 10-10-10 fertilizer on per inch of trunk diameter, and put lime on if you need to raise the pH, if the pH is getting a little low. Now, generally for nut trees like pecans, we don't like to fertilize them the first year. Uh, for some reason, they don't uh, respond very well to that. And uh, what you got to remember is after the fir first year, you're not going to see a lot of growth on that tree. It's going to look like it just sat there all summer and didn't grow. What it's doing the first year is growing the tap root. It's growing underneath of the ground. Once it gets a good tap root, then it takes off the next year and, and does a lot more growth. Uh, these nut trees are planted fairly far apart uh, because they're out there for a number of years. Hazelnuts are 15 by 15 feet roughly. Now some people will put them in rows and put them a little tighter in the row, but uh, it's generally the spacing for those. Persian walnuts and heart nuts are 35 feet apart. Chinese chestnuts 40 by 40 and the other ones uh, 50 by 50. Uh, it doesn't give you a whole lot of trees uh, per acre that way, but these trees get really big over time. And we have a lot of people uh, well, we're just going to plant them twice as heavy and then we'll take one out. Well, they never get around to taking that one out that's in the middle and they're, they're packed in. 
and particularly with pecans for diseases, if those trees are kind of packed in, those leaves stay wet a lot longer and you have a lot more disease on those and you can't get them sprayed very well if, if you're spraying them. So uh, for pruning these trees, uh, you want to remove about a third of the top growth at planting. Uh, this is if you've got a bare rooted tree. If you've got a tree that's grown in a pot, you don't have to uh, cut the top back. Uh, you cut the terminal just above a bud and remove all the side shoots. Uh, this encourages survival on bare rooted trees and gives you a pretty strong regrowth. And you want to prune young trees real lightly the first year. You're just trying to get them to survive and start to developing some structure. Uh, you want to select wide angled scaffold limbs. These are the limbs that are coming out from the side and maintain what we call a central leader or the like the center of a Christmas tree. Okay. So uh, this is particularly true on pecans and, and walnuts. Now, when you've got 10 or 15 good wide angled scaffold limbs, uh, you cut the central leader out. You just cut the center out of the tree to a limb that's going out away from the center of the tree to open the center of that tree up to get sunlight in and keep the height down on it. Uh, they're generally trained to what we call a modified or multiple leader shape. Uh, you generally just remove dead limbs on them and uh, the pruning on bearing trees is pretty limited. Well, we don't prune those very much once they're established and up and going. Now, you want to, as you're growing that tree, maybe it's in the next slide here. Here we are. Uh, generally with uh, pecans and hickories and black walnuts, we want to limb those up so the first limbs are at least six feet from the ground. Now, this is so we can put an aluminum sleeve on them like this to keep the squirrels out of the tree, okay? The squirrels hit this aluminum sleeve and slide off and they don't eat your nuts before they're mature. Uh, we've got trees over in the Arboretum that never have any nuts on because the squirrels start eating them as soon as uh, the milk starts forming in the nuts. So uh, squirrels and nut trees just don't get along very well. So uh, if you put this metal sleeve on, you need to have it away from other trees or have sleeves on those surrounding trees so the squirrels can't jump between trees or jump off a roof or a a power line onto your tree to uh, pull the nuts off. Uh, squirrels can move a lot of nuts out of a tree in a hurry. Uh, deer protection is really important. Uh, here's a, a hazelnut bush over at our Robinson Station where the deer got in to rub their horns. The deer like these little limp uh, whippy trees to rub their horns on and so they're really tough on young trees and they'll kill those trees pretty quick or have them coming up from the rootstock so that you have to regraft them. Uh, I, we don't, deer don't get along with nut trees very well or nut trees don't get along with deer. Uh, commercially with pecans they'll take some fence wire and do a big circle of fence wire that's at least four feet high around that tree on the base to keep the deer away from it. Or the other alternative is to do an electric fence, a, a double electric fence. Uh, you can make a cheaper one that's uh, five or six feet high with two strands on it and then you do a second fence uh, outside of that that's got two strands on that are probably a little lower than that and put some peanut butter on there with the, on put some aluminum pie pans on there uh, in the spring put some peanut butter on there and uh, that'll keep the deer back generally. The deer know when that power goes off so uh, be aware of that. Uh, the nuts are an agriculture crop and are subject to the weather. So we tend not to get a really good crop of nuts every year. And things like pecans tend to be biennial. They have a big crop one year and a little crop the next year. Uh, commercial growers down south will go in with their tree shakers that they use to harvest the nuts and shake some of the nuts off in the spring when they have a real heavy year to, to uh, get a better crop every year. As I mentioned before, pecans are native to the United States and you can see the green area is where they're native to and you can see they're native to the western Kentucky area. So we'll find a lot of seedling pecans out there, but we have moved those across the state and, and they'll, they'll grow in uh, this state and up north of this, but this is the native area where they uh, originated. If we look at pecan trees, they get very large. This is what the trunk looks like. They have a compound leaf like this. It's very shiny and 
We like to see them bear nuts in clusters like this. This is the major variety. This is the first scab resistant variety that showed up. And this has been used to develop other scab resistant varieties. Major is still a good variety. It was uh, found over in uh, somewhere around Illinois or Western Kentucky uh, years ago. It's a smaller nut variety, but uh, we need to grow northern nut varieties in Kentucky. The southern pecans, like the Mahan here, do not do well. Our season is not long enough to fill the shell. You can see down here we've got a Mahan pecan. Uh, the nut meat isn't filled out, it's shriveled because the season wasn't long enough to fill the nut meat. These nuts fill their nuts at the end of the season. They don't start filling that nut in the beginning of the season. Now up here in the upper right hand side you can see some nuts with the fuzz on that's bitter. This means this nut did not have enough time on the tree. Uh, this is what they call packing material. And if the nut matures on the tree, this ends up packed into the shell and not on the nut meat. So uh, you want to grow northern pecans. Major is a northern pecan. The northern pecans are a little smaller than the southern pecans, but uh, that's what uh, we need to grow up here. There are lots and lots of pecan varieties. It's very important that you select scab resistant or scab immune varieties so that you don't have to spray these trees for for scab. This is pecan scab. It's a fungus disease. It gets on the leaves. Here, here you can see uh, it's on the shells and a lot of those nut meats don't uh, fill out and a lot of the nuts will tend to drop off the trees. Uh, these are some northern pecan varieties that are generally pretty scab resistant. Green River is a very old variety. If you've been to the uh, Robinson Station there uh, out in Jackson, Kentucky, uh, the great big tree back of the parking lot is a Green River tree. It's a huge tree. It's been there for a long time. It was a big tree when I started working 40-some uh, years ago. Uh, Hark is a newer variety. Uh, it's highly disease resistant. It's got uh, uh, a major as one of its parents. It's a, it's a little smaller nut. It's got very high quality kernels and it is a really good pollinator for Kansas. Kansas is one of the newer highly disease resistant ones, and it have, has kernels that come out in halves, which is very important, uh, and they don't have the packing material or the fuzz on them. It's a light colored kernel, and what they're doing is planting both of these together, and they pollinate, and you can mix them up, and nobody can tell the difference between the nuts, so you don't have to separate out the pollinators. So any of the commercial growers like these two. Major's an older variety. It's still a dependable one, a good, good quality uh, good quality nuts. These numbers here are the numbers of nuts per pound right here. So you can see there's quite a few. Mandan is a USDA release. It's 63 to 65 percent kernel, which is very good. Uh, it's an outstanding variety, but it does have a darker kernel. Uh, 46 to 52 uh, nuts per pound, so it's a little larger nut than some of these other ones, but it has does have a darker kernel, so it's not one we're recommending for commercial production. Mohawk is a really large nut. I would not recommend it. Uh, it tends not to fill in our area and it does well in its early years and then uh, goes to pot as it gets the tree gets older. Pawnee is one that has an excellent light colored kernel. Uh, the, the feeling is that it's got some scab resistance but when those trees get big and get tight, scab is a big problem with this one. You can see it's 57 nuts per pound. Uh, uh, the growers that have had this have been a little disappointed unless they can spray it, and spraying pecan trees is very difficult. Posey is an old variety. It's a heavy producer. Uh, Yates is, and Yates 68 and Yates 127 are from uh, southern Indiana or western Kentucky, uh, the western Kentucky area there. Uh, we think Yates 127 may self-pollinate. It blooms out pretty late. John Britton seemed to think it's self-pollinated. Uh, Thin-shelled nut, pretty large nut. Uh, uh, it's one of the best. Uh, might be a little tough finding this one. Uh, here's Major. You can see it cracking out. You can see the small kernel there. There's Yates 68. There's Green River, a little larger nut. And there's Posey right there. Uh, these are some that aren't quite as good. I mentioned Mohawk and Giles is an old one that was used for uh, uh, pollination. You can see these mohawk here. Uh, 
some of the problems, the big pecan insect is the pecan weevil. And uh, this is what the weevil looks like. Uh, uh, it's not a very big insect. You hardly ever see them out there, but they go through the nut and lay an egg in the nut and that hatches and you don't have a kernel in there that you want to eat. Uh, they, after they've destroyed the nut, the adult emerges through a hole in the, in the shell. So you know that one's had a weevil in it. This is yellow sap sucker damage. It's not weevil damage. Uh, the yellow bellied sap sucker is a uh, woodpecker that has a red head, but it pecks the trees in a line. That's, that makes, that shows you the difference between that and a regular woodpecker. The, a regular woodpecker will peck all over the tree, but what they're doing is making holes in the trees to get the sap to come out and they drink the sap and then they come back to those holes to uh, uh, eat any insects that uh, are attracted to the sap. But uh, occasionally we see that on, on a lot of trees. Uh, to control pecan weevils, generally you can spray with seven. This is the carbaryl seven. Uh, carbaryl is the active ingredient. The last couple years, at least in the home uh, supply stores, they've changed the active ingredient in seven to a synthetic pyrethroid. I'm not sure if that's good for pecan weevils or not. Uh, this is applied in early to mid-August after a rain. Uh, it's really important on pecans and uh, chestnuts and any of these crops that have weevils in that when you pick them up, you don't leave those nuts on the ground uh, to let the weevils hatch out and get back in the ground to start another generation. Put them in a bucket, let the weevils come out in a bucket or, or uh, toss them in the fireplace uh, if they've got weevils in to get rid of those uh, weevils. Uh, the other, another insect that's a problem with pecan trees are stink bugs. And we've got the brown marmorated stink bug, bug which you see here, which you have plenty of down there. Uh, the brown stink bug and the green stink bug, they all cause the same damage. They probe through the shell and they uh, uh, hit the nut meats and then they create a dark bitter area in the nut meat. So these are showing up uh, through July and up into, well, August and very, up into September a little bit, uh, mostly August and September. This is a walnut caterpillar. It gets on pecans and walnut trees. It's a strange looking caterpillar. They will come down and cluster on the trunk and they'll all be uh, flinching a little bit at once. Uh, and you can destroy them when they get down on the trunk, but they do clean a lot of leaves off. You kind of got to keep an eye out for them. Uh, when you harvest pecans, when that pecan is ready to harvest, it opens up and drops off the tree. And uh, a lot of times you'll see pecans, you know, this time of year, they're still stuck up in the tree in, in the, in the, shell, in the uh, husks there. These are what are called stick tights and they did not mature. Uh, generally the kernel is not mature in those. So that's a, one that didn't have a late enough season to, to mature. Uh, for crack, cracking pecans, this is a inertial cracker. Uh, it's got a rubber band on here and you put the nut in here and you uh, pull this thing back in the uh, uh, rubber bands, let it go and the rubber bands slam the kernel and shock it and hopefully knock the shell off and leave a whole kernel in there. Uh, this is another cracker that uh, uh, one of our home growers found in, I think it was California called a Dave built cracker and he brought it and, and he said it worked pretty well. What it does is cracks the pecans and leaves the, the shell, the nut meats pretty whole. You don't turn this thing around and crank it. You uh, shake it back and forth and you crack them through. So this works on pecans, hazelnuts and English walnuts and almonds. And it ran about 200 bucks for one of those. There's the uh, uh, URL for that uh, nut cracker. Pecans are pecans crossed with hickories. Uh, they often mature nuts a little earlier pecans. Uh, they tend to be pretty poor producers for us in Kentucky. The uh, T92 is the best one. Uh, I have not grown that one, but uh, my experience has been that uh, we get a weevil in every hecon. You know, our, we've got a couple of hecons out at the North Farm. and Two years ago, we had a really heavy crop and they were like, on the ground about two inches deep under that tree and every one of them had a weevil in it because we didn't spray them. So uh, there's Burlington and, and Burton. Uh, we've got both of those in the Arboretum. The squirrels clean them off pretty quick. Uh, there's Burlington. This is a nice large one. And there's uh, a Bradley down here, uh, Hikon. 
There's a, a Hikon with a weevil in it. Okay, switching over to black walnuts. Uh, I wasn't sure what kind of walnuts you wanted to talk me to talk about, so I'm going to talk about all of them a little bit. Uh, this is a black walnut. Of course, it's native. It's got a compound leaf on it. I'm sure you're very familiar with these. Uh, it has very high quality wood and a, a very attractive uh, trunk. And uh, they're, they're pretty strong trees. They stand up really well. Uh, they're wind pollinated. These are the male catkins on a black walnut tree. And you can see the uh, uh, female flowers on there, just like on a pecan. And these are the small nuts that have been pollinated and set on the tree. And here we are just before harvest over here. Black walnuts are native to the US and it's kind of interesting. There's a paper showing how the Iroquois uh, Indians move these up north. You can find concentrations of these black walnuts growing where the Iroquois had camps up north in uh, southern in, in the US and a little bit into Canada, which is really interesting. Uh, the uh, Native Americans used the, uh, of course, nut meats for consumption. They made walnut milk, just like we meet, you have pecan milk and, and, and almond milk in the grocery stores. They mix the uh, ground nut meats with water. Uh, and they uh, uh, used it to flavor bread cakes and, and uh, corn soup. And then they used a lot of the walnut oil. They'd crack a bunch of nuts and cook them down. The walnut oil would go to the top and then they'd use that oil for uh, uh, food, paints, leather processing, body balm, hair dressing, and polishing implements. So uh, the Native Americans were really creative with these. Uh, with black walnuts, you want walnut varieties that have anthracnose resistance. This is another disease that knocks the leaves off the tree, just like on with pecans with the, with the scab. Uh, these are all anthracnose resistant varieties. The Old Thomas variety is a nice nut, but it does not have anthracnose resistance. And when we have a wet spring, it loses all the leaves. And without many leaves, you don't get a very good nut fill on the, on the, on the nuts. And the trees uh, uh, don't produce as well. Uh, Daniels is one that's productive, has a thin shell, about 41% kernel. Emma K, a bunch of these have been around for a while. Uh, uh, these crack out in, in halves and in larger chunks than a lot of the native walnuts. They're very difficult to extract from the shell. Uh, Emma K, Kraus, hay seedling is a fairly recent one. Pounds 2 is a really recent one that uh, has one of, been one of the best ones for crack out, about 55% crack out, has very thin shell and a nice taste. Uh, Neil number 1 is a new one. It's a really good one. Uh, a little slow to come into bearing. Uh, Ridgeway, also called Rabbit Ridge, 35% uh, kernel. That's a big difference from 55% uh, kernel. Uh, hay seedling is a good one. Uh, Sparrow is a little older one. It's a little smaller nut, about 28% kernel. Uh, we have one of these at the Port Farm. Not one of my favorites. I've got some other ones that I like cracking better. And of course, Thomas Myers is a good standard one with a pretty good percentage of kernel. Uh, black walnuts are a lot tougher to graft than pecans and some of those other, uh, some of the other nut trees. Uh, there's Thomas Myers with a, with a kernel in it. And I might point out that, uh, well, I'll talk about cracking in a bit. Uh, there's a Thomas Myers tree at our arboretum. And of course, uh, you let the walnuts drop off the tree to pick them up. Uh, uh, if you leave those walnuts in the holes, uh, the holes uh, leach uh, a little more flavor component into the kernels and make them a little stronger in flavor. I kind of like them that way, but uh, most people don't. Uh, to hold black walnuts, you need to remove the holes. You run over them with a car or you hit them with a black walnut. They have uh, the old corn shellers. They'll run them, the nut growers will run them through a corn sheller and, and that takes the, the husk off of it. Uh, they do stain your hands pretty well, so you want to wear gloves uh, unless you like that. <laughs> like being bicolored. <laughs> uh, I put them, I uh, put them in a five gallon bucket and uh, get my hoe out and uh, fill it with water and push that hoe up and down and get the, the, the husk off of them. And uh, some of the growers will use a cement mixer, throw a little sand in there that gets them cleaned up really nice. 
And when you do this, you notice some of the nuts float. These are the ones that don't have the kernels filled out all the way or they're blank. So you can toss out the ones that are floaters. The ones that sink are the better ones. And this works with black walnuts, hickory nuts, and pecans. Uh, in cracking, uh, these are some entries at the uh, uh, Kentucky State Fair. Uh, you can see some of these are cracking out pretty well. A lot of growers will get a pair of uh, wire cutters that have a little sharper point on them and you can crack them, then you use that to whittle away the shell and get bigger pieces of nut meat out, which works pretty nice. Uh, we have one black walnut processor and we've had several people that wanna grow black walnuts and shell them and sell the nut meats, but we can't find a a cracker that's cheap enough uh, to justify doing that, unfortunately. The nut growers were working on that uh, several years ago, but it didn't amount to, to much. Uh, so we have Hammond's products in Stockton, Missouri. They have 23 commercial hulling operations in Kentucky where they collect the nuts and hull them for you and then pay you for them. They purchase them, hull them, and then they ship them over to Hammond's. Uh, Interestingly enough, the shell is about as valuable as the nut meat to Hammond's because it's used as a, uh, uh, used for a lot, has a lot of other purposes. These are a lot of the uh, hulling stations in Kentucky. Your closest one is Midwest Herb in, Herb in Pineville over there in Bell County. And uh, this year they're paying 15 bucks for 100 pounds. That's with the hulls removed. So. Uh, you got to pick up a lot of walnuts uh, to make this uh, worthwhile. But uh, some people want to get them out of their front yards, and, and uh, so they do that. Uh, this was not a good walnut year because of the late spring freeze. Typically, black walnuts make it through the late spring freezes, but this was a particularly late spring freeze this year. Here's what walnut anthracnose looks like. It affects butternuts, heartnuts, black Jap and black Japanese, and uh, Persian walnuts. Uh, produces these little dark brown spots and causes the leaves to drop off and uh, we've talked about that. Uh, this is thousand cankers disease. Several years ago we were real worried about this. It's in Knoxville, Tennessee and it's a little insect that uh, carries this to the tree and it bores into the tree and inoculates the tree and then the trees die. Uh, they found it in Knoxville, Tennessee, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And, you know, we're real worried about it in Kentucky because uh, we're the second biggest seller of walnut uh, trunks for logs in, in the United States. And that's a big part of our forestry program. But it doesn't look like this disease is moving very rapidly. So we kind of settled back and we're not too worried about this uh, right now. Uh, heart nuts are what are called Japanese black walnuts. This is a selection of Japanese black walnuts. Uh, the regular Japanese walnuts are sort of a roundish looking nut that the nut meat doesn't come out of, but this sort of mutation produces these heart nuts. And they taste a little bit like black walnuts. I kind of like black walnuts better than, than heart nuts. Uh, they produce their nuts in long chains. We've got a couple, uh, couple of trees over in the Arboretum, but I never get any nuts. The squirrels get them right away, but they're real pretty trees. Uh, they do have a problem with thousand canker disease, or I'm sorry, with uh, uh, witch's broom uh, occasionally. Uh, this is the butternut. Then we have butternuts or white walnuts. This is the native range for uh, butternuts. Of course, Kentucky's right in the middle. Uh, they have compound leaves, look just like black walnuts, but the nuts are a little bit longer. Uh, these are really sticky on the outside here. Uh, we have a tree over in the Arboretum here that's uh, a seedling tree, and uh, uh, it's a little harder to extract the nut meats out of these. Uh, we've got a number of varieties that are good varieties, but uh, a lot of the nurseries aren't selling these. Uh, they have sort of a buttery flavor, of course, a hard shell like a black walnut, and uh, they're used a lot in the Northeast in fudge, and we typically use black walnut as a root stock. Uh, they do better so cross-pollinated. Uh, cross uh, one of the problems is, is juglans die back or walnut blight and that's the reason a lot of them don't get up to a very uh, old age and that's one of the reasons we graft them onto black walnut rootstocks. It helps out. 
Uh, uh, this thing eventually kills the trees. We don't have any chemical controls for this. So uh, uh, if it starts hitting the upper branches, you can prune some of this out for a while, but uh, generally the trees don't survive more than about 20, 20 years and they do better at high elevations in Eastern Kentucky. This is a bark nut. <laughs> this is a heart nut crossed with a uh, butternut, uh, kind of an interesting nut. Uh, I don't think you ever see another picture of those. <laughs> And then we have the hardy Persian walnuts or Carpathian walnuts or English walnuts. Uh, we tend to call them Persian walnuts. There's a great big old tree. It used to be on our Hort research farm. Uh, it hardly produced any nuts at all uh, for a large tree. Uh, these are not one I would recommend. When we have a really cold winter, this is, the, this is a Kentucky giant variety. After the Easter freeze, you can see it killed all the leaves back. And here's a... a tree that was growing in Lexington here after that freeze and it just killed the top top out of the tree. So they're not as hardy when we have a really cold winter or a late spring freeze. You can see some wood right here on this twig that where the twig has been winter damaged. Uh, these are what the female flowers look like. Uh, uh, Persian walnuts bear fruit terminally. You can see some nuts up here at the top of this one. The better ones are the ones that are lateral bearers that have nuts on the lateral branches. These come out a little later and avoid late spring freezes better. Uh, these are some of the hardy Persian walnuts. Allegheny is considered to be one of the hardiest one. It vegetates late, self-pollinates, a medium-sized nut. Greenhaven, Hansen, Kaiser. Kaiser is a really large one that uh, has gotten some awards at the Kentucky State uh, Fair. Uh, John Britton, uh, uh, grew a lot of those. Uh, Lake is a medium to large one and Retta is, a, is another variety, but uh, here's a Kentucky giant that didn't fill the, the, the uh, shell very well. Uh, these are some of the ones, there's a uh, 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 Kaiser variety, that's the really big one, it's a nice, it's a nice one. There's Hanson, there's Lake, they have a problem with walnut blight, which is a bacterial disease. It's very difficult for us to control bacterial diseases. And uh, I saw this down in the Owensboro area and you've got to spray with copper and I'm not sure it gives you very good control. Uh, we also have a leaf spot fungus that's gotten into our trees at the Arboretum and you can see that tree is prematurely defoliated, uh, which isn't good. Uh, with Persian walnuts, uh, uh, you've got to dry these within 24 hours of harvest or the nuts tend to mold. When I was going to school out in Oregon, these grew as uh, street trees. You'd walk home from uh, uh, college and pick them up on the way home and then dry them. Uh, dry them on a screen bottom tray or uh, dry them at a temperature 95 to 100 degrees, 105 degrees Fahrenheit and they'll dry in about three to four days. Uh, when they're dry, the divider between the halves breaks crisply when it's bent, and you store them in a closed container if you want to keep them in a shell to keep them from uh, picking moisture up. Switching over to hazelnuts or filberts, uh, the rest of the world calls these hazelnuts, and when Oregon started growing these, they decided they were going to call them filberts, so they called them filberts, and that name stuck. And then they got their production up so that they had to go on to the world stage and nobody knew what filberts were. So they've gone back to calling them hazelnuts, <laughs> okay? Uh, Sean Wright has a planting of these at the uh, Robinson Station. These are about six or seven years old. These are some of the uh, blight resistant varieties right here. You can see what the leaves look like and there's one that has a single nut in it. This is the Eastern filbert blight. It's usually not quite this apparent but this is a fungus disease. It's native to our area, and uh, it gradually kills the trees over a three or four year period. Uh, once you see these uh, lesions show up on the branch, it's too late. Uh, the infection takes place and these lesions show up a year or two later. Uh, and this is native to our area. Uh, there's two types of, well, there's a couple of main types of hazelnuts. There's the American hazelnut, Corylus americana, which is native to our area. Uh, these are very hardy. They have a small thick shell. They have resistance to eastern filbert blight. 
and the nuts often don't release or drop from the husk. Here's a husk with those nuts stuck in it. And so uh, typically when you harvest hazelnuts, you wait till they drop to the ground, then you pick them up off the ground. Uh, these are what the Eastern filberts look like. You can see the shell is a little thicker and the kernels are a little smaller. Uh, you can see uh, some of the Eastern uh, uh, hazelnuts right here. In Oregon, they grow the European hazelnut, and they grow these as a tree. Uh, they keep all the suck, they're grafted, and then they keep all of the suckers from coming up at the base by spraying them uh, several times a year to kill the suckers off. The main variety has been Barcelona in the past. Uh, this is the hazelnut of commerce. Uh, Turkey is the big producer in the world. It's also grown in Italy, Spain, France. And Oregon has a lot of production, but they're still a small producer in the whole scheme of things. They bloom early in January and February, and these are less hardy than the American hazelnuts. The nuts have a large size, they've got a thin shell, but these are susceptible to eastern filbert blight. Uh, and then there are some ornamental ones. This is a Turkish hazel, which has been used as a rootstock in some cases. It doesn't produce a really good nut. This is a corkscrew filbert. There are several varieties out. There's a one that's been released with red leaves. It's a very attractive one for your yard. Uh, but this has a corkscrew growth habit. Here we have the American hazelnut size con contrasted with the European hazelnut size. You can see the male catkins on here. You can see the female flower over here on, on the right. We tend to grow them as bushes in the, in, in the east coast here. I saw a photo of some of the breeding work at Rutgers University, and they're starting to grow them as trees instead of as bushes up there. Uh, and of course, those up there are on their own roots. Uh, uh, they're propagating hosel, hazelnuts now by uh, tissue culture and by uh, sort of layering them. Uh, now, so they are on their own roots, so you can grow them as a bush if you want. You don't have to grow them as a tree. Out in Oregon, they grafted them so you couldn't get, let them grow as a bush because only the tree part had that was the right variety. The, the rootstock was a seedling. Uh, our problem here is that catkins are also killed by late spring freezes or freezes in the winter. And uh, that's been a problem uh, for Sean Wright. Uh, over there at uh, the Robinson Station. Uh, these are the, this is not Ohio State University, this is Oregon State University, European Hazel uh, releases since 2008. In about the year, uh, in the 19, uh, late 1970s, Eastern filbert blight hit Oregon and it started taking out their orchards and they had to start spraying for it. So they started a breeding program to produce Eastern filbert blight resistant varieties. And these are some of the varieties, Yam Hill, Jefferson, Doris, Webster, McDonald, and Polly O has been the last one that they've released. Polly O is a real productive one. And uh, uh, these varieties work well in Oregon where they've only got maybe one or two strains of Eastern filbert blight. But we have a whole bunch of different strains of Eastern filbert blight here. And there was a comment from a 19, 2018 uh, article out of Oregon saying that they'd planted all of these varieties at the Rutgers Experiment Station where they have a area where they have blight to test their breeding uh, to see which ones are not, see which ones are resistant to the blight and all of these ended up with blight. So we've got too many strains for these resistant ones to survive for a long time on the east, in the east coast. So uh, these are European hazelnut pollinators that are resistant to European uh, filbert blight. Uh, gamma, eta, and theta, these are released from Oregon. And uh, uh, you gotta get the right pollinator lined up with the right variety for pollination. This is uh, 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 one of the ones that are arboretum here in Lexington. At the Robinson Station, they have a Yam Hill and Jefferson planting with eta, gamma, and theta in there for pollination. Uh, this was planted in 2011, and so far these have not been productive for them. Of course, they all froze out uh, this year, but uh, so far production has been pretty poor on these. 
Uh, they had a breeding program up north. Uh, Cecil Ferris in Lansing, Michigan, did a lot of breeding of hazelnuts. He released Grand, Tra Grand Traverse and several other varieties that have done fairly well up there. They're noted for being uh, very cold hardy. hardy. Carl Wyshecki in Minnesota has done some breeding and released some varieties. I don't know where you'd find these varieties right now. They've released a couple out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And then there are uh, uh, some from British Columbia that have been uh, released. Uh, I'm putting my bet on the breeding program at Rutgers University that Thomas Molinar is, is running. Uh, he's He's cooperating with Oregon State University and the University of Nebraska at Lincoln and the Nebraska uh, Forest Service. And they are working to develop nut varieties for the East Coast that have resistance to a lot of strains of this Eastern filbert blight. Uh, they've been promising us uh, some of their newest releases for the last three years and they haven't released them yet. So we're waiting to get those, but uh, my recommendation is to kind of wait till these varieties are released and plant these. They are working with uh, the company up there that uh, produces the, the hazelnut spread that really wants hazelnuts. And uh, they are looking at commercial characteristics. Uh, with hazelnuts, you want this, uh, it's called a pedicel, the outside of this hazelnut to, to come off. And uh, for blanched nuts. There's a couple different markets for hazelnuts. Most of the ones in Oregon are sold for the fresh market to eat whole or in shell. But a lot of the world supply hazelnuts is for processing, for using in uh, candies and, and, and cooking and so forth. Uh, these are some of the hazelnut pests we've talked about, deer. Uh, we get Japanese beetles in them sometimes and uh, this is a picture of an old planting that we used to have at the Hort Research Farm with some hazelnuts that the blight took them out eventually where uh, squirrels and chipmunks uh, get into them. Uh, hazelnuts produce blanks. They produce shells without nut meats in size. And, size. and the way to uh, figure out which ones are blanks is you drop them on a hard surface and the ones that bounce are blanks. So, uh, I was over in France several years ago and visited a truffle planting. And of course, truffles are grown on hazelnut roots. Uh, this is uh, the grower. He was from Switzerland. This is in France. And there's his truffle uh, dog. He's, he's trained to find truffles in the ground. We went out looking for truffles. It was not a good day to find a lot of truffles. He had had really good uh, production in some of the previous years but the last year and this year had particularly dry summers and the production was just terrible for them. Uh, we have, uh, I'm not pushing truffles, okay? <laughs> uh, you've got to have a really high soil pH to grow truffles, close to eight. And it's hard to get your soil up to that high. We've got, I visited one grower in Kentucky that put some out down in uh, Pulaski County. I don't know how he's been doing, but uh, they grow on, uh, American hazelnuts and English oak roots. And typically you buy these uh, trees that are already inoculated. It's, a, it's sort of a secret process as to how to inoculate the roots on a, on a hazelnut or English oak. So uh, that's the angle these companies have. And of course, uh, it's pretty expensive to put these plantings out. Uh, you can see he's got some uh, 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 shelters on for uh, to keep the deer off and so forth. In storing nuts, uh, you store nuts in the shell. Uh, you can store them in nush, net mesh bags in a cool, dry, well-ventilated well ventilated area, such as a garage or shed, but the squirrels will steal them away out of your shed, so you need to keep the squirrels away from them. Uh, if you shell them, you put them in an airtight container and freeze them. This keeps the oils from going rancid, and uh, they'll store for a number of years that way. Uh, we have some nut sources in Kentucky of people that sell nuts. These are not trees. This is if you want to purchase nuts. We have two pretty big pecan orchards in western Kentucky. There's Black's Pecans. They have about 60 acres of uh, nuts and native nuts in Hickman. And then we have Kite's Pecan. This is the biggest grower in the state. They have somewhere around 80 acres of pecans in Keevil, Kentucky, and they're up to production. Uh, they, sell, they sell them 
they shell them. Both of these shell them and sell them or they'll sell them to you in the, in the shells. Uh, uh, Steve sells a lot of these in, in Louisville. And then we have the Kentucky Nut Corporation, which is a smaller company in Moscow, Idaho, that specializes in some of the native uh, pecans. And then this is a, a smaller grower, Skip and Jeannie Shearhouse in Bowes, Kentucky, that have a pecan orchard and they sell most of them uh, locally. Uh, if you're looking for nut sources in, in the past, uh, Clifford, England, at uh, England's Orchard and Nursery has sold hickory, black walnut, heart nuts, and pecans on the internet. Uh, he's put out some pretty, pretty big plantings over there in McKee. Uh, he's primarily a nursery. And then we have a couple nut organizations. If you're really into nuts, we have a Kentucky Nut Growers Association. Uh, they have a Facebook page, and typically we have a meeting in the spring and then one in the fall. The spring meeting has tended to be around Elizabethtown and in the past, it's the fall meeting has been in Western Kentucky, but they decided to have uh, future meetings in, uh, in the E-Town area where more people can uh, come in. And uh, uh, after we get through this virus situation, they'll, they'll crank up uh, their meetings, but they typically have auctions where they raise money for the association by selling nut trees and nuts and uh, different types of plants in the spring. And there's a Northern Nut Growers Association, which is a national association. Uh, there's their website, and it's not too expensive to join either of these organizations. It's, I think it's five dollars a year for the Kentucky Nut Growers Association, and uh, I, it's a little more than that for the Northern Nut Growers Association. Northern Nut Growers Association has a meeting that goes around from one state to the next uh, from one uh, in different years. Uh-oh, we locked up. Okay, here we have uh, nutcrackers for uh, hard shell nuts. Uh, you gotta have pretty good grip to use one of these on a black walnut. This is a cracker called a potter cracker. It's been around for a number of years. It's good for hickories. You can ratchet it up to crack the nut. Uh, this is another one. I don't know the name of this one. This is from a Northern Nut Growers Association meeting that we had in Kentucky a number of years ago, and uh, this is a collection of nutcrackers there. Here's another one that growers like pretty well. You put the nut in here and apply some pressure this way. Uh, I have one of these, Mr. Hickory Nutcracker, and uh, Fred Blankenship uh, over north of E-Town uh, made these, but uh, he moved and uh, lost his... Uh, templates for making these, so he's quit making these. Hopefully he'll start making them again, but this is a really nice cracker. Uh, you've got a good leverage. You can, you've got a file along the bottom here that grips onto the nut so it doesn't slip. And then you've got a little sharp area here that you can use to chip off little pieces of nut to get to the nut meat. But uh, this has been a really nice cracker. I, uh, I wish Ed, Fred would crank up and and get these going again. Uh, and cracking nuts uh, for black walnuts and butternuts to shell them, you apply the pressure on either end, either end to end or across the longest dimension or side to side across the widest dimension. Persian walnuts, uh, you do pressure side to side, but not on the suture. Uh, suture is where the nut two halves come together. Uh, for heart nuts, you stand, stand it up on a vise or a hard surface and tap the point lightly with a hammer and they'll come out in, in uh, complete pieces in a lot of cases. Uh, hickons and hickory uh, apply pressure side to side across the widest dimension and pecan and hazelnuts you can crack them anyway. Uh, I think my hour's up. I'll take some questions if you like or if you want me to keep going. Shad never told me how long he wanted me to talk. <laughs> I was waiting to, to hear the singing start, John. So. <laughs> I've not heard the choir start, so I, I, I think what you've done was what we wanted you to cover, so that's, okay. that's great. Uh, so questions, there are bound to be some. Uh, you mentioned pollinators for the hazelnuts. Yes. And you mentioned the gamma, eta, and theta. And uh, 
uh, didn't um, Rutgers come out with, uh, or the consortium come out with the Beast? And I want, was wondering how that compared. I know Z Nutty has um, some uh, that would be good pollinators, and they were kind of uh, advertising. I guess I'm not familiar with those, so uh, uh, can't tell you anything more about those. Uh, Okay. Hey, after you after you told me the Barcelonas were not that good, I was about to say how proud I was of having the McDonald's Polios and Yam Hills till you told me that other part. <laughs> <laughs> I told you you weren't gonna like what I was gonna say. <laughs> but you know, keep them going as long as you can, you know, and you've had some for a long time, so uh, oh, yeah. maybe you're in a little bit of twenty five years. You maybe you're in a little bit of an isolated pocket there where that blight hasn't gotten around there. So, but yeah. Clifford England has mo a number of these blight resistant ones, and it showed up. Blight has showed up on most of them. Uh, the more resistant ones, it's not as bad as as some of the others. So, yeah. and, and I'm also talking with um, Kesnick over at Foggy Bottom mm -hmm. over there in Maryland with Rutgers mm -hmm. about. Uh, some varieties uh, of the new ones Rutgers came out with. Okay, good. I'm I'm really excited to see those. I think we have some real good possibilities for those. Number one, they're selecting varieties that are good producers, you know, and number two, they're looking for varieties that have good uh, cracking and, and eating characteristics and 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 uh, qu quality of the nuts. Nice nice looking nuts. I've seen some. I saw some pictures of some of the ones they were going to leave release at a seminar a couple years ago. They look really good. John, this uh, is a little bit off of, uh, uh, maybe off of the nut part of it, but still very much part of the production side. Uh, Phil mentioned that he had a lady uh, that was uh, tapping these. Uh, Phil, are you on here? Do you want to speak to that? Uh, well, I'll just say that uh, she contacted us before our syrup school she works with Extension. She's in the Piedmont area, and mm -hmm. she said she and her husband have a farm with a uh, with a pecan grove, and she was looking at at tapping those and and doing some attempting some syrup from the pecan. Oh, tapping them for syrup. Okay, uh, yeah, pecan. You can make pecan syrup. Uh, the nut growers have had some pecan syrup there at their auction occasionally. It goes for a really high price. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. But uh, you can tap them just like you do maple trees, sure. Not many people know that. Good niche market. Uh, the, the, the technique is the same, and you guys are well familiar with that. Do you uh, know if that uh, Dave built uh, cracker would work with hazelnuts pretty well? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what kind of volume you could crank out or anything? Uh no, I can give you the name. Uh, I can, I can, I, I can't remember the fellow's name. I can dig his name out and send it to uh, Shad Baker, and you can talk to him about how it cracks the pecans. Uh, he's over in Laurel County. Okay, over near I'll, London. I'll send his name and uh, phone number to to Shad. I can All put right. it on to Phil, so that we can get it to you. No, oh, I've got a good nutcracker. I bought it off the internet. It's called Grandpa's Goody Getter. And, yeah? Uh, and it, it'll it crack any nut you want to crack. Huh, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, it's it's really a strong build. And it'll go through black walnuts like crazy. Huh. And it'll crack pecans, hazelnuts, any kind of nut you want to crack. I'm going to look for that. What was, it, what was the name of that again? Grandpa's goody getter. <laughs> Grandpa's goody getter? Yeah, Grandpa. Okay. Grandpa's goody getter. Find it Phil, online. Phil yeah. has got a guy that lives uh, right at the mouth of the, the holler where he lives that's uh -huh. got a really good one. And he, he got it off the internet. And okay. uh, he, he cracks walnuts with it all the time. And he, he is very complimentary of it. Huh. Yeah, mine has a big lever on it and, and, and plates to put the plate on the top and bottom that the nut goes between. It just opens up, you put the nut in, it closes down on the nut, and you just keep applying pressure until it cracks. Huh, okay. 
It's neat. It's quick too. That's what I like about it. Okay, good. I'll, I'll, I'll look just that crank one up. up. I'll just crank up twenty or thirty and put them in a bowl and go up in my living room and get out my wire cutters and clean them up. Yep. There's a guy that's cracked cracked a lot of nuts. Those wire cutters work really well. <laughs> they do. Yeah, that was a great discovery. John, I had a couple of questions on grafting. Mm -hmm. um, are most Persian walnuts grafted onto black walnut rootstock? Yes. You, what about might, I don't know if you noticed it, but uh, one of the Persian walnuts that I showed in a picture, you can see where the it's grafted couple feet up off the ground and you can see the difference in the trunk uh, characteristics. Yeah. What about, can you graft um, commercial pecans onto native hickory trees? Sure, but they don't, you don't want to do that, okay? Uh, that, that's a, that's a real interesting question. Uh, uh, the faster that pecan tree grows, the earlier you get nuts and the more nuts you get. And hickories don't grow as fast as pecans. So the recommendation is to graft hickories onto pecan rootstock and pecan onto pecan rootstock. Now I was in Letchfield a number of years ago and Army Armstrong was a fruit specialist at Princeton before I started working and he did a lot with nut trees. And they had a bunch of uh, hick, uh, pecans grafted on hickory rootstock in, in the Letchfield area and I asked the agent, I said, why did the army do that? And he said, well, our soils are so poorly drained that the hickory survives better than the pecan. So that was the reason for that. So it was kind of an interesting observation. <laughs> yeah. when, if, uh, another question, John, if, when trees start uh, producing catkins, is that an indication the tree, the tree is mature enough to bear fruit or do you usually get that type of growth? Uh, before it's actually fruit bearing it, it usually, Some of those nut trees produce catkins before they start producing female flowers. Okay, so uh, people get excited, they see the catkins and they figure they're getting nuts and there aren't any female flowers on the tree. So uh, a lot of times it takes another year or two to get the female flowers on the tree. Okay. Any more? <clears throat> well, very, very informative. Very informative. I really enjoyed it. Excellent questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lang, and enjoy your retirement. Well, thank you. For those that came on late, uh, John is actually uh, retired, but they uh, they still uh, rely on him so much. Uh, he's still going in, but uh, he, he agreed to do this. Uh, for us in spite of his retirement. We oh. certainly uh, thank him for that. I, I enjoy doing it. I'll, so. I'll, uh, I'll make room for you in Virginia if you want to start a second career at any point. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can just get you a good nutcracker and crack, crack nuts on the side. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to go out to our Hort Research Farm and before I started they put some black walnuts out at the farm and I think I, I've got a plot plan for them. And we had that freeze and I didn't think there were any black walnuts out there. And so I walked out there two weeks ago to see if any of them had walnuts on. And one of them had a really heavy crop load. So I decided I'm going to go pick them all up and weigh them and get a comparison for something that for the, you know, Kentucky Nut Growers Association newsletter, uh, where we have one that survived that late spring freeze, you know, or had nuts after that late spring freeze. So, yeah. We sure didn't have many in Wise County. Yeah, they were, they're pretty slim. <laughs> and we don't have them in Letcher either. <clears throat> yeah. Well, folks, thank you for tuning in tonight. I know you found it informative. Um, Phil, do you want to tell them what we've got for tomorrow? Uh, yes, tomorrow night we've got um, Bonnie uh, Aker. She's one of our Master Naturalists, the High Knob Chapter. She's a uh, retired earth science teacher she's going to be talking about the geology of pine mountain and also may touch on a uh, high knob as well very good we hope that you will uh, tune in and join us tomorrow and uh, if not then we've got others that are scheduled so just keep your eyes peeled to the i guess the facebook page 
or uh, Phil's Five Point Friday or uh, newsletters from the offices and uh, that'll be your, your uh, alert, I guess, for what we've got scheduled. Thank you for tuning in. Okay. And uh, Jerry's feeling. Okay. John, thanks. Okay. Bye-bye.